All right, I have started it. I'm not. We'll see if it's going. It's as high as it goes. I'm going to be a little shrimpy tonight. We still haven't worked out our theme song yet. Oh, <laughs> that. All right, I shared it. We still haven't worked out our theme song yet. Oh. <laughs> that. Oh gosh. It's, it's, oh, I gotta turn it down. Thank you. This is like why am I over and over again? I like it. All right. Well, let us know if you're here and you're watching so that we can say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, and, you know, and share. Share this to your page. See if any of your friends or uh, loved ones or acquaintances might want to know something about happiness, right? And, no, I think there's a lot of people that aren't really happy right now. Yeah. You know, I think this is a, a good topic for this week. It with really is, you know. Everything that's going on. Uh, yeah, just humanity is so divided, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody's just, just kind of trying, I guess, their best to deal with the way the world is right now. Yeah. And, um, and they find, I, I have found lots of people, especially on Facebook, are, mm -hmm. you know, making themselves feel better by making other people wrong. Yeah. You know, and that's no way to live mm -hmm. a happy life at all. I know. Yeah. I think the takeaway that we'll get from this class is kind of just that, like, we can create our own happiness. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not in the greatest of situations, you can still make happiness by just, yeah. you know, tweaking your mindset Absolutely. in some different ways. Yeah. And we got lots of tips for that too. So anyway, hi, I'm Dr. Robin Lawrence with Get Well Family Chiropractic. Dr. Sarah Ponica with Get Well Family Chiropractic. Right. And thank you so much for joining us here today to learn about the science behind happiness. You know, there's really so much information, so much just juicy greatness we could have put into this class tonight. And we wanted to keep it simple and not eight hours long. So, right. yep. so shall we dive in? We shall. Okay. Um, oh yeah, and remember if you have any questions, right, put them in the comments, we'll answer as fast as we can. Um, if you think you, um, maybe one of your Facebook groups might like us, right, and some of the information we're sharing, you know, share it with them too. Absolutely. That's pretty much it there. Okay. All right, so the dictionary defines happiness as the state of being happy. Which sounds obvious, sounds, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. A little, you know, kind of stupid, but it um, also is ambiguous. So, some other definitions include good fortune, a state of well being and contentment, mm -hmm. a pleasurable or satisfying experience. Um, but still, none of these definitions really explain what happiness truly is. Um, the field of psychology describes happiness as the experience of frequent positive emotions, mm -hmm. such as joy, interest, 
um, pride, and infrequent negative emotions such as sadness, anxiety, and anger. Now, we're getting a little bit closer here, um, but to get a little bit more specific, go ahead and consider this definition. Happiness is the appreciation of life, moments of pleasure, but overall it has to do with the positive experience of emotions. So let's dig a little bit deeper into yes, all of this. Absolutely. So, you know, in what you just said, you know, your experience of your emotions, right? Because mm -hmm. people can experience sadness or anger or frustration and realize that it's, it's okay to have those feelings, right? Yeah. And then some people will experience those same emotions and it'll be like, oh my gosh, why am I so sad or why am I so angry? Like making themselves wrong about it. So it really is about your experience mm -hmm. with your emotions. So, oh my gosh, I won the lottery, yay! Right, you would think that it would be like the happiest time in life. Well, I can't tell you. It might make me a little bit happier, but it might not make me happier for very long. Yeah. So Dan Gilbert is a professor of psychology at Harvard. And his research has really focused on effective forecasting, which means predicting how people are going to feel in the future. He actually did a TED Talk. He's done several mm -hmm. TED Talks, but this one specifically was in 2004 called The Surprising Science of Happiness. That now, it has had like 19 million views on YouTube. So in his TED Talk, Gilbert provided an example comparing happiness levels of lottery winners to people who had just become quadriplegic patients. And, you know, the results were really quite surprising. He found that even after one year, just one year of living with these big changes, that both groups kind of leveled out at the same level of happiness. Now, this might sound surprising because you would think that, you know, we won the lottery, this is the happiest we're ever going to be, right? It really, it turns out that this is just a trick that the brain plays on us, that brain, that, that canoodle, it's smart stuff, mm -hmm. right? Gilbert's talk, Gilbert talks about studies that have found that after only three months, even major life traumas, with a few exceptions, have no impact on happiness, right? Three months, no impact. So this is really interesting to consider. You know, Gilbert also explains that we're equipped with a non-conscious cognitive process that helps us change our views of the world. So non-conscious, meaning we're unaware that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Cognitive, it's in the brain and process, well, it's a process. So let's go even a little bit deeper now into the science behind happiness. <laughs> so the frontal lobe is the part of the brain located directly behind our forehead, so right here, and it's responsible for behavior, learning, personality, and voluntary movement. Um, this is also the part of the brain that separates humans from other animals. The prefrontal cortex is located within the frontal lobe. Um, and then Gilbert, who we were talking about on the last slide, he explains that this part of the brain is an experience simulator that allows us to imagine experiences without them having to actually happen. So you can imagine what life would be like if you won the lottery, mm -hmm. even without winning the lottery. Right, and the brain will know no different, mm -hmm. right? You know, when we're dreaming, right? Our brain can tell no different if that dream is real or not. Mm -hmm. So no other animal actually has this ability that I had just mentioned. Um, according to Gilbert, the brain generates two types of happiness. So these are natural and synthesized happiness. So he defines natural happiness as the result of getting something that we wanted. And synthesized happiness is what we make when we don't get what we wanted. What he's saying is that it's possible to create your own happiness. Um, but our society actually has strong beliefs that the synthesized happiness, which is making our own happiness, is inferior to natural happiness. That, you know, people, the, the happiest people are people that got it by, you know, just being They got what they wanted. And, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and for me, what I hear when you say that is that our world is very materialistic. Mm -hmm. Right. I won't be happy unless I have that type of car or that job or that right. house. Right. Where synthesized happiness is, oh, my gosh, I've got a roof over my head and I've got mm -hmm. a car that runs. I'm going to create happiness yeah. around what it is. Happy. 
Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. What it is I have. So when we step back and really think about the theory that Gilbert has put out there, um, it's easy to see that society's negative thoughts on synthesized happiness are all wrong. They really are. You know, and before we move on to the next slide, I grabbed a couple of books off my bookshelf. Um, this one, right, we were just talking about synthesized happiness. So this is creative visualization. So, you know, sometimes we use visualization as a tool mm -hmm. um, to change the context of, of what we want, right? We, we see it, right? right? We see the, the job or the money or the relationship and we kind of just be with it and we create it in our minds. And as we put that out into the world, will it into being. will it into being? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, so I just want to share that um, creative visualization. Um, Shakti Gawain is the author. I will put that into comments. Um, I just wanted to say hello to everyone who's joining us. Uh, Kyle, Marie, Tom, passing. Good to see everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, be sure to share this to your timelines. Give us some likes or some some little hearts for us. You know, keep hitting that button. Let us know that you're here um, and that you're having. A good time. Heck yeah. yeah. All right. So some important points, right? What we can really take away from Gilbert's research is that first, a happy life is not always about getting what you want. It's about learning to enjoy the life that you do have. Two, next, synthesized happiness is not tricking yourself into feeling happy. It is actual, true happiness. And third, natural happiness primarily relies on external factors, right? The outside stuff, where synthesized happiness relies primarily on our internal factors, right? As such, synthesized happiness can actually be more long-term and more stable of a form of happiness than natural happiness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we call it, sometimes when we go to seminars, right, and we get all hyped up and, and we feel good, right? We call it a hot tub experience, yeah. right? You're in the hot tub, it feels good, you're happy, but now you're out of the hot tub and, mm -hmm. you know, that happiness is gone, whereas that synthesized happiness, right, will really last a much longer time. Mm -hmm. And then four, lastly, right, general happiness in life comes from the relationship between natural and synthesized happiness, right? Mm -hmm. So both forms really create the happiest life of all. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the chemicals in our brains and the kind of search through our whole body that are related to happiness. So um, first we're going to talk about serotonin. Serotonin is considered a happy hormone because of its mood boosting effects. So lack of serotonin is associated with depression as I'm sure a lot of people have yeah, well, the, the drugs are the SSRIs, the yep. serotonin, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can give yourself a boost of serotonin by <laughs> focusing on positive memories of things that you're grateful for, um, and that will help to boost your serotonin production. Um, getting some sunshine. So when our skin absorbs sunlight to produce vitamin D, this actually helps us produce serotonin as well. And then participating in low intensity exercises, like going for a walk, can also help you re uh, release serotonin. Next is dopamine. So dopamine is a pleasure hormone. It increases our drive to accomplish a goal so that we can experience the pleasure of the reward. Mm -hmm. um, you can give yourself a boost of dopamine by setting specific measurable goals and achieving them. Um, this can be as simple as just making your bed in the morning and then keeping that up every morning. Yeah. And then exercising. Uh, dopamine levels rise with serotonin levels during exercise. And then third, we have oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone, and it's released upon physical contact. <gasps> Yay! Yeah, I know, I'm getting hugs in the office today. I know. Oh, my heart is so yeah. full and so happy. So from childbirth, which oxytocin is hugely present in childbirth, mm -hmm. um, to a hug, oxytocin is there to provide feelings of love and trust. Um, you can give yourself a boost of oxytocin by getting a massage. Mm -hmm. um, so just the prolonged physical contact and getting a massage releases that oxytocin. And then hugging and cuddling loved ones often. So I know I've heard that 
giving someone a hug for at least 20 seconds mm -hmm. can um, cause that yeah. oxytocin oh, release. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, sometimes those long hugs are awkward, but they're so therapeutic. Yeah. yeah. And you realize it afterwards. So you just <laughs> talked about happiness, pleasure, and love, all from getting a little exercise, giving a hug, mm -hmm. right? Getting some sunshine. How simple could it be? Yeah. Right? I get words of wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> so the ancient Greeks, right? The ancient Greeks defined happiness as, you know, that joy that we feel when we're striving after our potential, right? Aristotle said happiness is a state of activity. When asked about requirements for happiness, Eleanor Roosevelt responded, a feeling that you have been honest with yourself and those around you. A feeling that you've done the best you could, both in your personal life and in your work and the ability to love others, right? Michael J. Fox, right, said, my happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance and inverse proportion to my expectations. So, you know, how do you guys define happiness for yourself? Throw it down in the comments and, and let's find out, you know. And I, and I gotta say that mo the, the happiest times of my life when I've been in service, mm -hmm. right? You know, I can come into the office in a grumpy mood and as soon as I start being with patients, mm -hmm. you know, immediately my happiness factor is yeah. up a thousand percent, you know, so just being of service and being in action. Absolutely. All right. So on to some research. So the director of the Harvard study of adult development, whose name was Robert Waldinger, he shares findings from an ongoing study regarding happiness. The study is 75 years in the making. It started in 1938 with a group of Harvard College students. Um, the study has evolved to include more participants, and every two years, a research group conducts interviews, obtains medical records, and completes brain scans. Waldinger states, the clearest message that we got from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. Yeah. The three main lessons learned from the study are all about relationships. So first, the more socially connected someone is to family, friends, and community, the healthier and happier they're going to be. Um, people who are isolated suffer from poorer health and are less happy. So with that in mind, reach out to your elderly yeah you know. your grandparents mm -hmm. or your elderly aunts and uncles maybe even your neighbors you know with the whole I mean granted the stay-at-home order has been lifted there's still a lot of people that are afraid to get out in public so yeah. you know check on them with a phone call or you know if you have the capacity to do a video call mm -hmm. you know just something to just be in communication with people to be with them and see what's going on in their lives okay so then the next thing that um you know, they got about relationships and happiness and everything from this study was someone can be in a crowd and still be lonely. Yeah. So the number of friends that someone has doesn't necessarily indicate happiness, but having close friends and, you know, maybe that one, two really close connections mm -hmm. really does make that difference. Um, and then the final lesson learned here is that meaningful relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains too. Uh, the study found that when participants had others to lean on and continually developed close relationships, these individuals experienced more overall happiness. Yeah, you know, and you can see those in brain scans, which is really cool. I love, yeah. that's why I love the science behind this. Like mm -hmm. you can really see it yeah. in the scan. So you might be asking yourself right now, well, how do I develop these deeper relationships that you're asking me to do or that, you know, the research shows is going to make me happier and protect my body and brain. So it really is as simple as replacing screen time, just not right now, with face-to-face -face time, right? With the people that you care about, right? You're cultivating new relationships with. Um, you know, liven up a relationship, go do something new together, right? I think that's, you know, one of the most important things is don't get stuck in a rut, right? Mm -hmm. Go do something new that yeah. you've never done before. Um, you know, maybe reestablish date night with your significant other 
Or, you know, start a weekly game night with a group of friends, make it a potluck and maybe travel around to other people's houses. Yeah. Um, you know, reach out to that family member um, that, you know, maybe you've lost touch with. Maybe there was some sort of disagreement mm -hmm. or hurt feelings in the past. And, and honestly, you don't even remember what it was all about now. And you could just call them up and say, yeah. hey, you know, I have this thing in my brain and on my heart that we had a disagreement a long time ago and I don't even remember what it's all about. Do you remember? You know, because I miss you and I love you and I want you to be a part of my life. Um, you know, try joining a group of my like-minded like -minded friends, right? There's meetup groups that you can go on, you know, maybe you like to hike or kayak or paint or sculpt, you know, you can meet a group of people, you know, that like to do that and go out and do those things. Um, you know, although the logistics might be a little weird right now with the coronavirus, you know, keeping people apart, there are websites out there, right? Like I just talked <laughs> about that meetup, right? Um, so maybe you want to join again, uh, you know, whatever you're interested in. Keep it simple. Um, try something new. Come to the chiropractor. That's yeah. always fun and new. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to talk about gratitude. Mm. So gratitude is a really great way to foster just a happier disposition. Robert A. Emmons, PhD, has um, been coined the world's leading scientific expert on gratitude. What? There's yeah. an expert on gratitude? Right. <laughs> His research findings show that people who regularly practice gratitude report experiencing more joy, pleasure, optimism, happiness, and higher levels of positive emotions. Emmons emphasized the importance of making a distinction between feeling grateful mm -hmm. and being grateful. Mm -hmm. According to Emmons, feelings develop from the way that we see the world the thoughts that we have about the way that things are and perceptions of the way that we think things should be. The being grateful is a choice. Mm -hmm. Evan says, gratitude provides a perspective from which we can view life in its entirety and not be overwhelmed by temporary circumstances. So let's take a look at some techniques for becoming more grateful. I love it. Perfect. So these are often tips that I give to my patients um, when they come to an impasse in their health and they're just not really gaining the strides that we had thought, that, yeah. you know, that there may be. Because so much of people's health, right, their physical health is also wrapped up in their mental and emotional mm -hmm. health. You know, and while I'm not a mental and emotional health expert, right, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, it is important that I at least acknowledge that people have those things. So, you know, one of the best ways to really experience gratitude and be grateful versus just feeling grateful is to start a journal, right? I tell my patients at the end of the day, write in your journal three things that you were grateful for that day. Like really grateful for, you know, the sunshine. I was grateful my car started. I mean, it could be silly stuff, right? Whatever you're grateful for. And then the next night, write three more and review the three that you mm -hmm. wrote the day before. And just keep, you know, do that 30 days in a row, right? And then you're going to have a whole list of things that you were grateful yeah. for for the whole month. And then all of a sudden they come in and they're like, Dr. Robin, Dr. Robin, I am so grateful for this and this and this. Like they <laughs> just start seeing grateful everywhere all over their lives. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's super cool. I feel like it just really gets you to stop, like take a step back and you know, maybe get out of the negativity of the day or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. Just think about, oh, there, there were good things. There were good <laughs> things. Exactly. You know, and another one, uh, reflect on these questions. What have I received from blank, right? From the universe, from my prayer, from my exercise, you know, whatever that, you know, from is for you. And what have I given to blank? Who have I been in service to? What have I been in service to? Um, and what troubles and difficulty have I caused, right? Because mm -hmm. sometimes people go out and they just cause trouble, yeah. right? And that's no way to create gratitude. So what, what are you causing out in the world? Uh, three, right? Prayers of gratitude are considered in many spiritual traditions as the most potent form of prayer. 
four, you could visualize, remind, visual, sorry, visual reminders, right, are a great way to trigger mindfulness and thoughts of gratitude. So what do I mean by visual triggers, right? Uh, maybe a post-it note on your bathroom mirror mm -hmm. or your favorite quote um, in your car or, you know, a screensaver on your phone, right. you know, anything like that on the refrigerator, just post things. Or maybe you've got a favorite statue or a favorite mm -hmm. painting or something like that that you could keep with. Um, in your eyesight. Um, you know, this one's fun, right? Practice the motions. Yeah. Smile, right? Say thank you to a perfect stranger. Like somebody holds the door for you. Oh my gosh, thank you, right? Or they let you pass in the store, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Um, write letters. Oh my gosh, nobody writes letters anymore. I got home from the office last night and my son Gabriel had gotten two handwritten letters in the mail from oh. friends and he was just lit up yeah. by the fact that he got that. So write letters of appreci appreciation, you know, regularly. That's going to strengthen emotions of gratitude in you and in the person For receiving sure. the letter. Um, and each circumstance offers an opportunity for appreciation. Be creative, right? Look for situations where you can express gratitude. I told, uh, I often, I often tell this, you guys are gonna think I'm weird. I often mm -hmm. tell the, there's this one really cute young kid that works at Schnucks where I shop for groceries. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, either getting carts or he's, you know, sweeping the floor or the people now that are sanitizing the carts. I tell them, thank you. Thank yeah. you for keeping a clean store for me to shop in. You know, thank you for having safe carts for me to hold on to while I'm shopping. You know, and I think that that's a perfect place to create an opportunity to create gratitude. Absolutely. And I'm sure they love to hear that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is defined as a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations used as a therapeutic technique. So, um, ultimately, mindfulness is the focus on the here and now. Achieving mindfulness is not easy and it takes a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. um, research has shown that those who practice mindfulness regularly are happier because their thoughts are not consumed by thoughts of fear and fear of something yet to come, um, controlling future situations, or analyzing circumstances that have passed. <laughs> That's my brain on the regular. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that reminds me of um, the uncertain past, future. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Great conversations with people that aren't even in front, of, in front of me while I'm driving my car to the office, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so <laughs> mindfulness teaches the ability to center yourself and to develop your inner resources, which deepens your happiness. <clears throat> and mindfulness can lead to happiness by ending the loop of negative thoughts that might have just been running through your head mm -hmm. all day, yeah. um, helping you connect better with others, deepening inner contentment, you know, just kind of, you know, being relaxed, not having a million things going through your head, mm -hmm. and then enhancing the experience of gratitude, like I've been talking about. Yeah. And, you know, and mindfulness doesn't have to be a form of, like, you don't have to just sit quietly in meditation to be mindful. Um, you know, I studied with a Buddhist monk for a couple of years, and, you know, he really had us practicing mindfulness, and, you know, in doing the dishes, can right. be a mindfulness meditation. You're just focused right here and right mm -hmm. now on the dishes in front of you, getting them clean, the circular motions or right. whatever it may be. Mindfulness can be in vacuuming or in mowing the lawn. Um, and clearly mindfulness can really be when you're with someone. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really just right there with them um, and clearly acknowledge that if a thought came into your mind and you could just, you know, let that go and, right. you know, say, hey, sorry, I was thinking about something else. Can you say that again, please? So like we were just right. saying, right? I know, I know. There we go, right? It doesn't happen mm -hmm. automatically. It does take practice. Um, and you can actually retrain the brain. So here's the exercise to get you started. It's the five senses exercise, right? So the goal of mindfulness is to focus on the current moment. And this exercise is going to help you get started. So notice five things that you can see 
Try focusing on something you don't normally notice, right? A shadow or a leaf or, you know, depending on where you're at right now, maybe a bump in a wall or, you know, something that you don't a, normally a see. Saver a screensaver. A <laughs> that was, yes, exactly. Um, then you're going to notice four things that you can feel. Bring awareness to the things that you currently feel, right? The touch of your clothing, maybe a breeze, um, the hardness of your chair, the you lumbar know, support, lumbar support, exactly, <laughs> right? Then you're going to notice three things that you can hear. Listen and mentally note three things that you can hear. A bird chirping, um, the hum of the refrigerator, the uh, splashing of the water in a fish tank, right? Mm -hmm. I often notice that one because I have two. Mm -hmm. um, Next, notice two things that you can smell, right? Try to identify those smells that you wouldn't normally notice, right? And then last, notice one thing that you can taste, a sip of water, gum, food, etc. And this will, this, just using this exercise, five things you can see, four that you can feel, three that you can hear, two you can smell, and mm -hmm. one that you can taste. And it'll just use, it will just, it just goes in the brain that way, and it just is wonderful. All right. So once you're comfortable with the idea of mindfulness, you can try this technique to deepen your practice even more. So step one is turn off automatic pilot, autopilot, by bringing awareness to what you're doing, thinking, and sensing at this moment. Take a moment to settle into a comfortable posture. Notice the thoughts that come up and acknowledge your feelings, but let those thoughts pass. Mm -hmm. Step two is bring awareness to your breath. Focus only on the act of breathing and how your body reacts with each breath. Focus, wait, no. <laughs> for example, um, consider how your chest rises and falls with your breaths and how your belly pushes in and out and how your lungs expand and contract. Find the pattern of your breath and anchor yourself to the present with this awareness of your breathing. And this is making me just want to I know, right? relax, and, relax and, and be mindful. You know, and you said you, you know, anchor yourself to the breath. And you know, a lot of people are like, well, what does that mean, anchor myself? So, you know, what I do is I actually, I visualize an anchor, like a ship's anchor. And it's connected to the bottom of the river or the lake or whatever. And it's just, it's solid and it's right there. So just, you know, you can maybe even put your hand on your chest as a, as an anchor, right? Just to anchor into that breath. And then step three is to expand your awareness outward by noticing the sensations that you're experiencing, like any tightness, aches, or perhaps a lightness in your face or your shoulders. Um, and then you can take this step even further by expanding your awareness further to the environment around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, so Nancy Etkoff is an evolutionary psychologist and an instructor of the science of happiness at Harvard Medical School. Her research into the question of happiness exposes surprising results. So her findings reinforce things that we should have known all along, right? Like the fact that having flowers in the house does make us happier. I know it makes me happier, you know, and she also did a Ted talk, right? There's lots of great Ted talks out there. You know, she says we are wired to pursue happiness, not only to enjoy it, but to want more and more of it, right? We were, we're born to be healthy and we're born to be happy. So one of the key points in the science of happiness is that happiness and unhappiness are not end points of a single continuum, right? In the study of recovering hospital patients, two groups were examined. One group faced a brick wall, while another group looked out on trees and nature. The group who looked at the brick wall were in the hospital longer, needed more medication, had more medical complaints. And according to Edkoff, happiness is contagious, right? Our happiness will have a positive effect on our friends, but also our friends' friends, right? Smiles are contagious, yep. right? You smile at someone, they're going to smile back, then they're going to smile at the next person, right? And I... And in all honesty, if I had to sit and stare at a brick wall, I think I'd need more medication too. 
right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> looking at trees and nature, right, produce those happy feelings, and our happy feelings produce happy health. Mm -hmm. So that made total sense to me when I read that, but I thought it was uh, interesting to share with people. And now here we go. Yeah. Um, so research is growing on the connection that nature makes us healthier and happier people, like Dr. Robin just mm. shared. Yeah. <laughs> so a 30-day study was conducted that people that involved people doing something wild every day <laughs> for 30 consecutive mm. days. Participants were asked to complete a survey at the beginning and end of the study about their perceived connection to nature how they interacted with nature, and how they felt about their health and happiness. The study showed that there was a scientifically significant increase in people's health, happiness, and connection to nature just by being encouraged to spend time with nature. Um, and amazingly, the participants' newfound happiness was even sustained for months following the challenge. Mm -hmm. One theory accounting for the nature happiness link is the biophilia hypothesis, which suggests that we love nature because we evolved in it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and when I, when I first was looking at this, you know, doing something wild, right, I was like, well, how do they define wild? Like, is someone right. going out and doing crazy things, mm -hmm. or are you going out into the wild? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a really great technique too. you know, go walk barefoot mm -hmm. in the grass, right? It's actually called Ground. grounding. You can absorb the electrons from the earth into your body. And those electrons actually produce chemical reactions in your body for happiness. So nature is really cool, right? It teaches that there is nothing I mean, nothing is wrong with us, right? Studies show that people's body image improves by focusing on nature. Uh, the diversity that's found in nature reinforces the beauty in being different. You know, time slows down. Urgency and deadlines, they just melt away. Ecosystems embody harmony and balance. You know, just sitting and quietly witnessing this balance and harmony really renews our appreciation. You know, nature calls you back to reality. You know, allowing you to surrender comfort and control reinforces acceptance. You know, as we move from the chaotic noises of society and replace them with the sounds of nature, we become calmer. Being in nature provides a sense of awe, right? I was, uh, Gabriel called me into his bedroom and outside his window was a red cardinal. And we just sat there and we just looked in awe of this <laughs> bird, right? You know, we realize that there are much bigger things than us, right? And, you know, feel free to share in the comments. Is there anything in particular about nature really that makes you especially happy? I'd love to see what it is. Giving. Mm, so <laughs> studies show that lottery winners do not become significantly happier than they were before. Wealthy people are not significantly happier than others either. Mm -hmm. Research has found that possessing wealth and material goods does not lead to happiness. In fact, giving them away actually does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, studies of people who practice volunteering have shown that they have better psychological and mental health and increased longevity. Another study has shown donating money or spending money on experiences rather than material goods is positively correlated with happiness. By being more generous and charitable, happiness increases with the amount of money that you give to people in need by volunteering or spending more time helping other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you may be asking, <laughs> how? What? Like, I need some ideas. What are some ways for me to give, right? So. You know, volunteer for a cause that you care about. You know, maybe it's animals. You could foster a dog or uh, volunteer at an animal shelter. Mm -hmm. You know, cook for those in need. We, I, we probably all right now have neighbors, right, that either have been laid off or lost their jobs yeah. or couldn't go to work. And, you know, just cooking a meal for them would be amazing. Or, you know, don't um, volunteering at a, a soup kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, donate blood, right? We need blood right now. There's always a shortage of blood. 
become a mentor, right? There's some kids out there that could really, yeah. really use someone to look up to and respect. Um, assist your seniors, right? Our, our elderly neighbors and loved ones. Um, you could lift a soldier spirits. There's so many programs where you can write a letter to send overseas or, or little gift boxes that you can mm -hmm. donate yeah. to. Um, there are many veterans organizations that would absolutely love or volunteer at the USO, right? That would love some volunteers. Um, help build a house, right? Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, these people have worked hard and, and you can help them, you know, just get over the goal line. Um, you know, maybe you have a skill set that other people don't have. And you could simply share that skill set or a mm -hmm. trade. Um, you know, and honestly, if you're out on a walk or in a park, just pick up the trash, right? Put it in a trash can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's definitely one way to give. All right, so we're coming close to the end here. So just some final tips. These are some proven techniques to cultivate mm -hmm. more happiness. Um, savor the moment. What? Take <laughs> really just just be with that moment savor it yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Um, take control of your time yeah which yeah I can probably do more of that <laughs> um, act happy and you will become happy <laughs> right is that a fake it till you make it kind of thing no 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 no, 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 no. Um, exercise and make time for plenty of sleep yes Give time and attention to close relationships. Mm -hmm. Be mindful, like we talked about. Express gratitude and practice more giving. Yeah, absolutely. All right, one final quote, because I love quotes. If you've been in the office, you know they are everywhere. They're on the ceiling, they're on the walls. Um, the key to happiness is knowing you. Yeah, I'm gonna start that over, because this is really, really important. You know, the key to happiness is that knowing is knowing that you have the power to choose what to accept and what to let go. I'm gonna say it again. The key to happiness is knowing that you have the power to choose to what to accept and what to let go. So before we part, if there are any quotes that make you feel good, um, you know, put them in the comments, share them with everybody. We all love good quotes, right? you know, feel empowered and excited, you know, know that you have the ability to choose happiness. It's awesome. All right. So, um, if anybody wants the resources that were used to put this class mm -hmm. together, because this is the end, um, go ahead and reach out to us and we would be happy to send those your way. Yep, absolutely. You know, and, and I love that I always get this one. <laughs> right, that so, you know, thank you so much for joining us tonight to learn about the science behind happiness. We really hope that you gain something of value tonight, right? That will help you to better understand about how you can go about working towards leading a happier life, right? Um, again, you could have been anywhere you chose to be with us. We are so very grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you have any further questions, you know, share them in the comments or reach out to us later via Messenger. We're, we're here to help you in any way that we can. Um, again, we hope that you're able to join us next Tuesday, six o'clock, same time, same place, right? And next week's class is called Check your habits, mm -hmm. right? And we're gonna look at how habits form, how they turn our habits can be good or they can be bad, right? And we're gonna head, um, and, right? Mm -hmm. So how we form them, are they good? Are they helping us, right? So do me a favor right now, go over to the event page for next week, click on I'm coming, I'm interested, share the heck out of it, right? Because everybody's got habits that, you right, you check mm -hmm. yourself before you wreck yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, share with your family and friends. Let's really fill this class up and get out, you know, how we can now, now is the time, mm -hmm. right, to take control of our lives, right? We're, we just brilliant. talked about controlling our time, being mindful. Mm -hmm. So now we can be mindful of our habits and let's take mm -hmm. a look at them. So again, thank you for coming. We will see you all next week. That's the theme song. Do, 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 do. <laughs>